AK Real Color Marker Pens. There have been a lot of hype about these in the last couple of months, so let's do a quick product review and see what they're really like. This video is brought to you by my Patreon members. Members such as Count Macula, a troop leader and one of my first members. Their support enables me to bring you content just like this video. So thank you, and if you'd like to join, details are in the description. A couple of months ago, AK Interactive released a new range of paint markers featuring their Real Colors paint range. The initial release included 34 individual colours which could also be purchased in a box set or several 3 or 4 colour sets based on specific subjects. I'm going to perform a series of paint tests to see how these markers perform and try and determine where I see them fitting into our hobby toolbox. So the first product that I'm going to have a look at will be their dark aluminium. Now I'm just going to paint this onto some bare balsa wood not because I think that this is a realistic use of this specific colour, but I want to see how metallic type colours will fare over a wood bait. You can also see I'm just testing how thin I can get a line to be painted on here because these, um, because these markers have a uh, quite a large tip. I'll leave that aside to dry. I just want to see how long it's going to take these metal colors to dry without any interaction. Okay, so I've got here a block of balsa which has been painted previously with AK's third gen acrylics. I'm just going to overpaint using the markers. So this Dunkel Gelb here, this could be realistically done to represent a newer wood rather than the gray finished older wood which I've done previously. And just a uh, thin application here. I'm not trying to get a really heavy coverage or full opacity. Realistically, if I was doing this, I wanted this to look like a new piece of timber. This might be the way I'd go about it. And I'd probably sort of rub it back a little bit or add a, a oil finish over the top just to add some interest and depth to show the wood grain. Now what I do notice here is that this paint's fine over existing acrylics. There's no issue there. It's not conflicting with the existing paint that's been down. Uh, this was painted previously about six months ago, so the acrylics underneath are certainly well and truly dried and cured in place. I'm quite happy with the coverage there. As I said, I wasn't going for full opacity. I just wanted to see if we can get the paint down. Now, over the top of this, because this will be almost touch dry now, I'm just gonna use some of the red brown and see if we can get it to either blend or we'll find out if that's dried really quickly. That red brown should probably cover this pretty solidly. And that's what it's doing actually. So the Dunkel Gelb color I've used underneath obviously has dried well enough. Now blending there's an issue. I can see that, yeah, it's not blending in well. It's just going straight over the top, dry to the touch. So a couple of things that we're learning there. So these paints do dry relatively quickly, certainly on a porous surface like this wood, and we're not gonna get any blending. Now the aluminium, yeah, it's coming off on the thumb, so that's still drying. So there's another interesting thing, even on a porous subject like that balsa, the aluminium takes a while to dry. Okay, so let's go on to painting some Tiger Road Wheels. This is a 148 Tamiya kit. So good plastic, that's a good start. And we're just gonna use the Dunkel Gelb here. We'll try and get a even coat on and we'll see how well that does. So one thing I'm noticing is that the paint's actually going on. It's not removing the previous paint which I've put down. It's just adding to the depth that's there in the same, same pass. Easy enough to go around the edge there, and that's pretty good coverage. I'm just going to touch up this other side here and we'll blend that in well. Hit it with the hairdryer, flash that off quickly, and get that dried. We're going to come back and do a second coat. I want to see how well that blends and whether it will lift the paint off. Now you'll notice that I haven't used any primer coat here, and in fact, on all the plastic work, 
I'm going to do in this demonstration, I'm not going to use a primer. Real colour paints have a tendency to stick extremely well to most primers. But what I want to do here is I want to see whether we can use them without a primer coat and whether they're going to hold fast to the plastic. So just drying that coat off as well. That's really good coverage actually. I'm quite impressed with uh, the coverage that we're getting there. So moving on to the rubber black, we'll do the rubber section on the outer edge of these early road wheels. Now with this tip to this pen, it's quite large. Admittedly, I don't do a lot of 148 armor, more 135 scale. So I would think that the tip of this marker would suit 135 a little better. The ray surface would be a little higher on a 135. Here, yeah, I'm just going to catch the top of it. I'll have to come back and touch that up, I think. The colour's quite good. Don't mind the rubber black colour here that's with this. The application here is pretty straightforward. I think most people would find this an acceptable uh, means of painting a road wheel. Let's just wipe that away, but I'll come back and I'll um, touch that up with the Dunkel Guild later. Now let's go around, touch the edge up. Here you'll see I'm just going to touch up that edge before everything dries. Um, the interesting thing here is it will blend a little bit while both paints are wet. You'll get a muddy, murky kind of uh, Dunkel Gelb colour. Just moving on to the top of the turret for this Tiger. So again, Dunkel Gelb, pretty standard mid and late war colour. Uh, let's go and see if we can get a good coverage and find out what the paint's going to be like off these markers as we apply it. Now something I'm noticing here is there are visible lines from the layers as we move across. Now this could be a technique thing which I need to work on myself uh, as I discover more about how the paint comes out from this marker. So just using the side of the, of the head of the marker here um, finding that, yeah, the paints, it'll be more evident once this dries, but it's pretty clear here that what's happening is the individual spaces where as each pass goes through is leaving a brush stroke through the paint. Now, what I'm thinking of is if we add a little more paint after I get this first layer down, but instead of drying that off and going to another layer, maybe we can just add a little more in there and then hit it with the hairdryer as we're doing here. We'll come back and do another coat and see if I can fill that in and remove the brush strokes from the previous layer. So as you can see, doing multiple layers isn't a problem. It doesn't have a tendency to want to lift off the coat underneath. It's obviously held fast, which is great because there's no primer, as I said before, which means that these real colour paints are holding fast to the raw plastic underneath. Now, I'll be honest, this is not something that I would recommend. I wouldn't suggest using these markers to paint a large surface like I'm doing on the top of this turret. They really aren't the best medium for doing it. Uh, I certainly would be using uh, a spray gun. We're just going to cook that off again with the hairdryer. And let's come in with a couple of colours. So here's the red brown, a couple of colours that we would use for a three tone camo. Now, what I want to see here is over a lighter colour underneath it, this darker colour, how is it going to go with its coverage? Now, my initial reaction would be like if you were brush painting, it will require a couple of coats because it's not going to reach full opacity. It will allow some of the Dunkel Gelb to shine through underneath. But I'm going to try and give it a, not a heavy coat, but a, a reasonable coat to get to at least 70 or 80% opacity on the paint on the first pass. You can see here that as we go back over the work that we're already doing, it is covering it. It's not moving the paint around. It's not lifting anything from underneath. As I say that, I've done exactly that. I've just pushed aside some of the paint I've laid down previously. Give that a cover. We'll go on to the olive green. 
to be honest, this is the colour I think it will struggle with the most if it's not going to cover the Dunkel Girl well, but it does seem to be, um, yeah, the coverage here is really good. But that's a little surprise. I actually thought the green would struggle a little bit. Yeah, and again, this is the thing that using a marker, you're gonna end up with brush strokes in these tight areas if you're trying to paint large open areas like this. Let's come around and try this other side here and tidy that up. So for a first coat, it definitely gets enough paint down. The, the opacity and the coverage is uh, very good. You can't really complain about that. It will definitely require a second coat, but for a first coat, that's really good. So again, hit it with the hairdryer. You can probably see just in these images here that there are brush marks. Instead of leaving it that, let's try and make this like a French camouflage pattern from pre and early war. Now, in that case, you would put all the colors down and do what I'm doing here. Come back with a black marker and put in those thin black lines that run around each patch in the camouflage color. Now, they're pretty thick. So I'll just try with this one here to do a thin line. That's a little bit of a problem because the marker doesn't really allow me to do it as well as I'd like. Okay, so because I've got the flat black and I've got a German figure directly underneath it, let's go and fill this tanker's uniform and paint that uh, with the black. And let's see if the marker will get into all the little nooks and crannies that are evident in this plastic figure. Something that I think is going to happen here as I'm doing this is Matte paints in this range don't cover quite as well as the regular paint. It's like there's a different thinner or some substance used in the paint. It comes out quite thin and it's definitely gonna require multiple coats. Now, the problem with that is matte paint doesn't like going down in thick coats or often in multiple coats like this, it'll tend to end up being uh, it'll have a slight sheen to it, like a semi, not quite semi gloss, but it'll have a slight sheen to it. So we'll just cook this off. Yeah, you can just see in that matte paint that some parts are more flat than others. And that's something that I think is a realistic issue. Okay, so we're just gonna try burnishing the paint here and see whether the paint will burnish. So I have a stiff bristled brush. I'm just rubbing it around. I just wanna see what it will do. I'm not trying to make any particular effect. You can see how that shine has come up there. All right, let's try pushing over the edge here. Will it chip or burnish? Yeah, I can see a little shine there, so it's definitely burnishing up. Let's try the matte paint. Now, matte paints tend to burnish quite well with the acrylics. In fact, this is lifting off. That's a bit of a surprise. Um, Try around the edge here and see whether it's consistent or it's just in that one spot. It's chipping up as well. So there's an interesting thing. Okay, let's just try the green. So over this raised surface, I'd expect it might just chip off a bit. It's definitely polishing up what we call burnishing here. No chipping, but it's definitely got a sheen to it. This burnishing process certainly made evident about the lines. Now I'm just using the other end of the brush and you can see it didn't chip the paint away. It rubbed a little bit of the paint off the end of the brush, that blue streak. I'm just gonna try and chip it with the metal end here. Yeah, it lifts the paint quite easily. Yeah, those tweezers, yeah, that's a kind of a result I would expect. So what are my thoughts here after doing a quick test? Well, these markers certainly have a place in our hobby and I think we can uh, use them for very specific purposes. So let's have a look at what they're good at. Look, they do have a good range of color in them. 
Uh, I think for armor modeling, things like rubber black, flat black, the camo colors, uh, there's colors for the tools, etc. I think that range of colors is uh, broad enough that we'll get some use out of those. The issue I really see here is how they apply the paint. So what you can't do is if you try to paint a large broad surface, you'll end up with brush marks through it, which are quite evident. If you get them in the right light, you can catch those. Now with a brush, you can cast off to remove those brush strokes. So that casting off process is effectively very limited amount of paint on the bristles. You drag the brush very lightly across the surface and you remove excess paint and you remove the brush marks that might be in the work that you've just completed. Now we can't do that with these markers. The problem is that as you put the foam tip down onto the surface, the marker wants to apply more paint. So you just double down on the problem that you're trying to remove by adding more paint to it. So that's a problem. Uh, what are they really good at? Well, efficient, small jobs that require a little bit of paint, possibly detail work. Such examples I could see would be pioneer tools on armoured vehicles, uh, road wheels, the rubber surfaces on road wheels. Those kind of small uh, jobs that take up a, a lot of time if you're going to pull out an airbrush or you're going to pull out a brush to do it. It doesn't require clean up obviously using these markers. So there's a great benefit in using them for those kind of purposes. And possibly that's what AK has the intention of them being there for. So are they a massive leap forward for the average scale modeler? Is it the next great thing? No, it's not. The potential for these to do those small detailed tasks that uh, require uh, a leap forward in efficiency for us, yep, they're great for that. But you aren't going to use these to paint an entire model. Um, at least you're not going to if you want to get superior results. They do require the use of a new technique. You need to learn how to apply the paint and how it works on the surface that you're working with. Certainly in this test, I have used unprimed surfaces. And as I mentioned in the video, the purpose of that is, I would expect these paints to apply on a primed surface really well, um, much like you would get out of a brush. The test here is, how do they put paint down on an unprimed surface? And is that suitable for use in our day-to-day -day scale modeling? So they will apply paint um, once the paint's dried, it will adhere quite well. Uh, that surprised me. Yes, you can chip it away using a metal um, scraper or something similar. And look, you're gonna do that to most acrylics. So no surprise with that. Now, what I haven't done is I haven't discussed whether or not these would be great for aircraft modeling or Gundam or ships or cars. Uh, I don't spend a lot of time doing those other genres, but I can see value in something like sci-fi or Gundam, getting use out of the broad range of colors that are in these. And considering that uh, you often have with those genres, a lot of small components that don't have big broad areas, mark, uh, paint markers might be useful for you. In conclusion, an interesting product. Certainly I can see that there is some value for them. I wouldn't rush out and grab the massive full set at this point, unless you have a very broad range of models that you can go to <laughs> going to be working with. Other than that, really interesting product. I'm glad we did the test. I hope you got something out of it. And if you've got any comments, please put them down below. Tell me what you think. Tell me if you think I didn't do enough. We might do a second video on this in the future and let me know what you think. And don't forget to subscribe. See you in the next one.